Let's pray. God, we thank you because uh, even in our weakest moments, we've already experienced and we know that you can move whatever is in the way, God. We know that you're powerful enough to have your way. So God, in in times of, of need, times of desperation, God, may we just be reminded of that that uh, you've conquered the grave, and there's nothing more to do. In your son's name I pray, amen. You guys can have a seat. Well, we are beginning a new series over the past few weeks, we have at least, and uh, it's called Living Jesus, the Sermon on the Mount. And so what we're doing, the Sermon on the Mount takes up about three chapters of the book of Matthew, so... Instead of uh, having Justin read three chapters to you or myself read three chapters to you and knocking it out in one day and uh, you going all glazed eyes, we thought we'd uh, spread it out over several weeks. It's uh, based off a book. Our series is based off a book by Randy Harris called Living Jesus. And we have some copies of that if you're interested in reading that and you don't have one yet. But uh, this whole series is is about the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, uh, Mike Mosby did a good job a few weeks ago of memorizing three chapters of Matthew and uh, and kind of giving us that hands-on experience of what it might have been like for those that were gathered there with Jesus and you know, how they took that. Now, um, Mike and I have talked, and it's it's something where uh, it's really cool that he did that, right? And uh, three chapters, and obviously it's helped him out in his walk and just having that scripture in his life. But that's the last reason why we decided, and Mike volunteered to kind of do that, right? The the point of the whole thing was to to kind of say, in really first hand experience, like what Jesus was calling us to do, and uh, and how He calls us to do that today. Justin last week kind of shared about about that, about how um, you know we have the choice, uh, and we have two different kind of ways of viewing this Sermon on the Mount. It calls calls for truth, hard truth for us to live by. And uh, we talked about that last week, and Justin talked about before we try to live that, we have to believe that we can live that. So the first question that he just kind of mentioned is, is this something that you can do? Like, you have to decide that before we go through this series and talk about it, is this something that you can do? And so that includes being able to say, yes, I can do this with Christ in my life. And the next step is, will you? Will you actually try to live that out? And so uh, that's where we're at and where uh, Justin kind of left us is, uh, can you do it? And once you say, yeah, I can do it when I, when I know God's in my life, I can meet these expectations that God's calling us to. And then after you've answered that, it is, will you? Will you try to do what God's putting in here? Or will you just push it off and say, well, I've got God's grace when I fall short, will you go after this? So that's what Justin shared last week. This week, we're kind of starting at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, it talks about the, the blessings. Blessed are those who, and we'll read that in just a minute. But when I was thinking about this, I think about all the different ways we say bless or bless you, right? So think about some, and I want audience participation this morning, okay? I hadn't done that in a while, so we're going to make going back to it. Shout out some ways, you don't have to yell at me, but you can say them out loud, some ways that uh, we use the word bless, or a combination of some words that include bless in in our everyday life. Somebody sneezes, right? Bless you. If you know me, I sneeze about ten times in a row, so you have to say it ten times. What else? How else do we use it? Bless your heart, right? That's a good one, yeah. We usually use that when we laugh about it and not, we talk about how we can say anything. At least old church ladies can say anything when they say bless their heart afterwards, right? Like, can you believe what they wore to church today? Bless their heart? Right? And they can get away with it. How else do we use it? Bless us. All right? Think of anything else? Yeah, yeah, God's really blessed me with a good house or health, right? We say bless this food, don't we? Sometimes we take a 
uh, something grilled and very unhealthy, and we ask God to do something amazing with it and turn it into a healthy salad. Bless this, right? So we use blessings all the time. And I'm not saying those are bad situations to kind of recognize that maybe we have some good things in our life, right? But is that really what God is talking about when he talks about blessings? And when we go through these scriptures, is, is that really the point of blessings? So I want us to read this morning Matthew 5, 1 through 12. So we've got about 13 verses here. We'll have it up on the screen. But <clears throat> really focus on what we're saying now. We could go over these, and if you've read scripture before, these are just kind of, you're going to kind of find yourself just kind of wanting to kind of cruise through this without really trying to understand what God's saying here. So really try to dig in and ask a tough question this morning. What's, what's God getting at in what he says? What is Jesus really trying to say right now to me? Like, obviously, I know he had a purpose for it then, but he's got a purpose this morning for me to hear it. So what is he trying to say to you as we read this? Now, when he saw the crowds, he went up on the mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are those, uh, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. And blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your, great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So we can look at that and, and kind of get bogged down by all these blessed are and this is what happens, right? Right? and can kind of be confusing. And what do some of these terminologies really mean? Poor in spirit, right? What does that mean? I think Jesus blesses those who are most desperate for them, right? We didn't hear blessed are uh, the billionaires, or blessed are the wealthy, or blessed are the big families, or blessed are the married or unmarried, right? It says blessed are the desperate, uh, blessed who are those that are desperate for them, right? Those that are poor, humble, persecuted, mourners. Those are the people that God's saying blessed are. And sometimes we kind of, I, before reading this and studying on this, I kind of think of myself, well, God's blessed me. Uh, I, need to, I need to find myself being poor to, to be blessed, right? Or I need to find myself losing people to be blessed. How many of us feel blessed when we're persecuted? When somebody's giving us a hard time? Or somebody's harassing us because we've chose to put God in front of that relationship. Or how many feel blessed when we've lost a loved one or somebody that we really care about? Our first instinct really isn't to say, thank you, God, for sending uh, losing that person right in my life, for taking them away. We don't often think of that. Can you believe that in our most difficult times, God is there blessing us. I think our scripture this morning is, is teaching us that. You know, he's pointed out the most difficult times in our life. And he's saying, blessed are those people. Can we be blessed in our most difficult times? Maybe above any other time in our life. Is that when we're receiving God's blessing the most? You know, we just talked about, we often say, God has blessed me, referring to our homes or our possessions, or our jobs, or our families. Do you think that's what God means when he means blessed? Could there be a little more behind it than that? See, I think Jesus' idea of a blessed life and our idea of a blessed life have nothing, almost nothing, in common. Now think about what makes you happy, what would set you aside and say, what are you thankful for? How do you feel blessed? I know I'm going to say I feel blessed by a family, an extended family that still loves and cares for one another. I feel blessed by my job and the opportunity I have. 
I feel blessed by uh, being able to be a dad and a husband. You know, those are the things that I would go to. I'm sure most of us would go to those first. Those aren't bad things, are they? But is that really what God's talking about in blessings? See, I think our American culture has kind of done this to us. We've, we've sought the good life, the American dream, right? That American dream, the good life, is having all the stuff you want. Having things go your way is the blessed life, ain't it? That's our mindset of do we feel blessed or not. You know, when everything seems to be going wrong, we don't stop and say, this is exactly where I want to be right now. This is it. I am so blessed. Yes. Lost my job or I might lose my job. I, you know, it feels like people are dying all around me right now. And, man, I, I can't get rid of this pain. And, and uh, man, my, my spouse hates me right now. Man, this is going good. I love it. All right? We don't do that. But can you believe that in our most difficult times, when everything seems to be going wrong, that God's blessing us there. You know, the American culture, again, tells us the perfect family, the vehicles we drive, the boats or four-wheelers or extra things we have, homes, maybe an opportunity at early retirement. Those, that's the good life. I'm sure early retirement is probably pretty good, but that's what the culture tells us, right? But Jesus is describing to us what the good life is really like. Jesus tells us that the blessed life is knowing that God loves you and you're, you're in God's hands. See, we, so many times we, we get it all twisted and we forget that the blessed life is knowing that God loves you no matter what your circumstances are. No matter what you may be facing, you can count on God's love and that God's directing you. And he's got you in his hands. That's the blessed life. Jesus starts with the Beatitudes here in the Sermon on the Mount, I think, because we've got to understand that uh, we are loved and cared. Before we do anything else, before we live out anything that he, he's calling us to live out in our lives, we've got to understand that he loves us. And he cares for us, no matter what's going on. No matter what we may be facing. See, you can't make yourself loved by God by doing the Sermon on the Mount. By following his commands. Right? This week, I'm going to brag on my daughter, because I still can, because she's young enough. She doesn't care about me sharing in sermons. JC, three different people have come up to us, or sent messages to us, saying how awesome JC is. And uh, JC does really good in school. And um, and so we try to remind her of how hard she's working at school and she's doing her homework, and that's why she's making good grades, right? But three times this week, people have come up to us and said, I see J.C. at school sometimes when I sub, and she is just the sweetest person. She's always caring and helping people out around her, right? Yep. <sighs> Takes after her dad. <laughs> no. Nah. And next time. Somebody brings in a, a student that doesn't go to school there yet, like a preschooler trying to get exposed to kindergarten and things. And uh, JC's helping that kid. And the mom sends something to us, and the uh, person that brought him sends something to us saying, JC helped that kid all day long, feel welcome and happy and cared for and made sure that they were included, shared the little square on the circle and all kinds of things, right? Now, I could feel really proud of that that could be a really good thing and it's it's a great thing but jc's qualities of caring and loving doesn't change how much i love her right that never changes she could be getting on yellow and red and getting phone calls home and i might be a little more aggravated and a little more exhausted with her but my love's going to be the same my love's not going to change See, we can't do the Sermon on the Mount and do what God calls us to thinking that this is going to earn good graces with God. That maybe when, you know, later on, like, all right, I should be all right. I've, you know, I've tried to follow his commands. Before you can even try, because you're going to fall short if you don't understand and believe and experience that God loves you. No matter how bad you've messed up or how crazy life is right now. 
God loves you, and he cares for you. And then out of that experience, after you've really experienced that love, that grace, then we can't do anything but want to go please him, right? But love others. See, so many times, myself included, I forget that. Like, I forget that I just need to experience his love. I need to let him love me instead of me trying to please him. You know, our Beatitudes and the, the blessings that we've said, they call it the Beatitudes. They don't say blessed are those who don't make mistakes, for they're awesome. Or blessed are those who come to church every Sunday because they're liked by their pastor. Or blessed because uh, blessed are those who get a promotion. Or blessed are those who have it all together. It doesn't say that to us, does it? It says blessed are those who need the blessings the most. So we live out the Sermon on the Mount out of the love we've experienced from God. I'm, I just want to stop right here. If you've not allowed God to love you because of something in your life, something that happened to you or something you've done, like, this is the moment right now. No matter how many years you've pretended like you've had it together or, or maybe how many years you've been in church or how many years that you've put this facade up like life's okay, like if you've never let God love you just because he loves you, not because you're trying to do good, if you've just never let him love you, like today's the day. Like, experience his love today, not for anything other than you're his child, and he loves you. The only reason. No other reason needed. He loves you. That's how we live out the Sermon on the Mount. Because we've experienced that amazing love. That we don't deserve. Think about this. When was the first time you've experienced God's love? Like in a, maybe in a crashing, passionate way. Like overwhelming way that you've experienced his love. I would imagine... Maybe not all of us, but most of us could easily go back to a time when life wasn't good. Right? Maybe when somebody died. There was an opportunity that somebody just loved us unconditionally when we were unlovable. Maybe a, a test came back positive. And at that moment, you had nowhere to go but to God. Maybe when you lost your job or you thought you were going to lose your job. Again, nowhere to go but to God, right? When you've hit rock bottom in whatever that situation is, I would imagine that you've experienced God's love in a way you've never experienced it before. See, that good life that we all try to, to seek after, that can happen in all circumstances. No matter what life is bringing us, that can happen. And this isn't just for a Sunday morning, like, pep talk reminder. This is something that we can live by, that when life's going great, that's great. But I know the storms will come because God tells us storms come on no matter the, what we put our faith in, on the rock or on the sand, it's going to come. Storms come the same way in life no matter how we live, whether our foundation's Christ or ourselves or whatever, uh, the storms are going to come. That good life can be experienced like that genuine life of peace and happiness that only God can provide can be experienced. God's love for us produces that good life, doesn't it? A blessed life. So regardless of what the world says or you think about your circumstances because you don't have the job that produces for your family or you need this or the relationships aren't good, no matter, regardless of all that, what the world may say or you may say about your circumstances, in God's eyes, you're blessed. Play a little what-if games as we kind of reflect and think as we kind of close out here. What if the worst thing that could ever happen to you, what if that worst thing that could ever happen to you could also be the best thing that ever happened to you? Is that what he's saying this morning? What if that worst thing that you can ever imagine, that you don't even want to go there right now, what if that worst thing that ever happened to you could be the best thing that ever happened to you? What if the hardest thing you have to go through or your family has to go through 
is the one thing that God wants to use to work good in your life, in the life of the people around you. See, so many times we get to why me's, don't we? we? Get to why me's because life's hard. And this morning I want to remind you, just like Justin did in our Bible studies, reminded us this past week that storms come. Storms will come. Jesus in Scripture says storms are going to come the same way if you build your foundation of your life on Christ versus you build it on whatever else. It's the same kind of storms come. We're not uh, privileged because we have a, a life put in Christ. Those same storms are going to come. But what if? What if you started living your life like that worst thing that happens is the best thing that's going to happen to you? What if we are able to live that life out? How would the world see us differently? This morning, I just want to encourage you to like really go there as we close and we worship for a little bit. Really go there and allow yourself to experience that and to think about how you can really be blessed in hard times. Like the blessings isn't the nice homes and the the all-together culture thing that we so chase after all the time, myself included, the blessings in God's love, no matter where you're at. And the blessings of those worst things in life is where God can do the best thing in your life. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your love. None of us. God, I don't deserve your love. We don't deserve your love, God. But I thank you so much for it. God, my prayer this morning is if there's somebody in this room that's not ever just let their guard down and really just let you love them, God, that that they would do that this morning. That they wouldn't just sit still and try to keep it together. That they would just admit to themselves that you love them even though they have just been pretending. Maybe pretending for years, God. God, and whether we're going through rough times now or or we have been or we do in the near future, God, as you tell us that storms are going to come, life's not going to be perfect, God, I just pray that we're reminded that those worst times, God, can be our best times of drawing closer to you and experiencing your love. So this morning, God, as we close in worship, just speak to us in a powerful way. Speak to us in a way where we can just let our guard down and admit life's not perfect. But we want to experience your love, God. In your son's name I pray. Amen. As we close and stand in some worship, I just want to encourage you. Take take the seat. Make it a prayer table. Make it a time for you to pray standing up or sitting down or come over here. Pray with me or put a prayer request on that prayer board. Do whatever you need to do to, to have this moment with God to respond to what he's been putting on your heart this morning. Okay? Amen. Let's